Good morning. Uh, it's nice to be uh, back in Washington in April. I was a little chillier than I'm used to. It's, I bring you greetings from Zambia, which is a, a country in Central Africa. Um, one of the LAMI, I see a new acronym, low and middle income country. We're transitioning from low to middle income in, in Zambia, but we still have a high level of material poverty. It's a society which attaches high importance to uh, both child health and education. And um, you may have seen on your international news in recently an interview with our founding president, Kenneth Kaunda, who turns 90 this month, the same time that the nation turns 50. Uh, he was responsible for uh, pioneering the creation of a, a non-racial, non-tribal society, which uh, has uh, been a haven of peace in the rather troubled region of Africa. So I'm proud to be a citizen of Zambia, uh, even though I don't look the normal color for a Zambian citizen. And, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the multilingual, multicultural characteristics of our society in my talk. Is this, and it has a pointer on it? The red one. Okay, great. And to move forward is this one. So um, I'm going to try to uh, identify some critical gaps in the scientific knowledge base of what is being called developmental potential, which is one of the building blocks of the initiative that this workshop is around. Um, my uh, starting point is that the human species uh, is not only uh, distinctive in the uh, animal world for its plasticity and, by the way, also its resilience of the CNS uh, and by its dependence through infancy on human caregivers, uh, but also by its disposition to communicate with language, and perhaps uh, most important for my talk is uh, by its capacity for reflection, evaluation, and innovation. These are not characteristics that we think of as being studied elsewhere in the animal kingdom. And uh, the human species is also distinctive as a social being uh, in which organization and participation are embedded in what is known as culture. And one of the features of uh, human cultures uh, is that they are uh, very uh, particular in different societies. Um, the seminal paper by Charles Super and Sarah Harkness called the developmental niche uh, articulates three dimensions of the uh, niche to which uh, members of the species are expected to adapt over the course of development. The physical and social settings are the easiest to recognize, but they also have very uh, short way beneath the surface, very different child care practices, and requiring psychological and social investigation, they have different implicit theories of what caregiving is about and what it's for and how to do it. The um, very influential articles published in The Lancet, and I, I'm not quite sure because there were so many new names this morning whether any of the authors are here, but I know people associated with the authors are influential members of this gathering, um, and they call themselves the ICDSG, the International Child Development Steering Group, have articulated a position which is primarily a political argument about social justice in response to economic inequalities. Um, and probably all of us in this room agree about that because otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, but it also includes a technical argument which is based in science about the strategic benefits of prevention. And in order to strengthen that argument, perhaps in order to sell it to uh, uh, stakeholder groups, uh, organizations with funds to invest, um, the argument presented in that collection of papers, in my view, tends to exaggerate the degree of consensus within the scientific community on what constitutes developmental potential and on how its fulfillment is best supported. So we heard a, a, a clarion call this morning for identifying in the behavioral domain something uh, as universal as the growth curve for uh, physical weight by age, uh, which has been so uh, effectively applied in, in, in that 
area of human services. Um, the, the group advocate an intervention package along similar lines to a strategy which UNICEF launched in the 1980s, which went by the name of GOBI. GOBI stands for, um, where are we? Uh, growth monitoring, oral rehydration therapy, breastfeeding, and immunization. And the evidence marshaled in the 1980s was that these were universally effective causes of infant survival, growth, and health. In this new era, ICDSG proposed that stimulation and caregiver sensitivity are universally effective causes of the development of children's cognitive and socio-emotional competence. But psychosocial intervention to optimize the development of young children cannot be operationalized with the same degree of cross-cultural equivalence as a vaccine or breastfeeding. So this package is under critical examination. Why is it so difficult to specify principles of human development that are universal across cultures? Well, I'd like to talk about three um, sources of difficulty. Firstly, the demands and affordances of the developmental niche are different in different cultural settings. Secondly, theoretical biases exist uh, which are, are well documented in the history of science that what is seen as a satisfactory explanatory model in developmental psychology uh, reflects a great deal of the cultural uh, intuitions of the population who write these theories and for whom they are written. And thirdly, I'd like to talk a bit about measurement challenges. The assessment of children's competences depends on culturally specific practices, uh, like the IQ test, for instance, which all American children have become experts at handling by the time they're about seven or eight years old. That is not a universal cross-cultural phenomenon. And uh, culturally sensitive instruments um, there are still those who believe that there's such a thing as a culture fair test, although I thought that, that was pretty much dispelled in the 1980s and 90s, that myth. So environmental variations. Young Zambian children from low-income families, especially in rural areas, have very few industrially manufactured toys or puzzles or books. But they draw on a rich heritage of music, dance, and games, and they make their own ingenious toys. Sometimes when I've showed slides of these to American uh, undergraduate audiences in uh, Baltimore, I found that the students would come up to me afterwards and say, I now realize I had a deprived childhood. I never made a toy. All the toys I had were given to me prepackaged. Um, they get little parental input, Zambian children, to their games, but they receive guidance in their zone of proximal development, as Vygotsky would call it, from more competent playmates. They get most of their preschool language socialization from siblings and peers rather than from adults. And they derive support for emotional stability from a socially distributed system of care. This is a diagram which uh, illustrates the uh, complexity of what makes a good theory or gets a theory accepted. And I, I think the, the tendency is for uh, uh, Western scientists to focus on are we cutting the world at its joints? Do uh, the, what we propose as theories uh, actually correspond to what exists in the real world? Uh, we do acknowledge that we who are creating these theories are a part of that real world and we have a, a biological structure, but we don't always acknowledge that the uh, uh, cultures that we uh, bring to this process of theory construction is not, are not solely determined by our biology. They are also influenced by our history, by the social structure of our societies, and they give rise to cultural preoccupations which have a strong influence on the goals and traditions of our theory making. So for instance, within uh, Western theory, where supposedly there should be a, a body of consensus at this point in history, uh, we can see that uh, the um, Theories of uh, B.F. Skinner are still being invoked by some researchers and by uh, uh, the uh, theories of James and Eleanor Gibson. 
Piaget is still cited as a giant of developmental psychology, as is Vygotsky, and their more recent exponents, Pierre Dazen and Michael Cole, have quite different views of uh, what we can learn from developmental psychology. Yuri Braun von Brenner and Arnold Samaroff's systemic models introduced a whole new dimension to Western theorizing about development. And some of these other people towards the bottom here, less well-known, Jean Lay, Richard Schweder, Margaret Beale Spencer and Barbara Rogoff, each of them has their own distinctive theoretical interpretation of the context within which uh, children are developing. So uh, if there is consensus, we have to try to integrate all of this. Um, the models which are proposed by Western science tend to be theoretically elegant, uh, parsimonious, and uh, testable. And yet, if they fail to connect with the local realities in which they're being applied, then they have limited utility, and so they cannot really be regarded as a source of quality. To import a culturally alien package of cognitive stimulation can only be justified if research shows that prevailing local stimulation techniques are less supportive of children's development. In most cases, such research evidence does not exist. Design of appropriate, effective early childhood care and education services for African societies requires much closer attention than it has received to not only the adverse economic conditions in rural and peri-urban neighborhoods, but also to the strengths and the limitations of local child rearing practices, local knowledge, and local attitudes. So let me give an example about measurement here. Um, we, we see in much of the uh, Lancet articles reference to uh, percentage uh, increases, uh, standard deviation, amount of variance explained, all based on standardized instruments which have had very little adaptation to the uh, population to which they're applied. But if you apply um, an externally packaged standardized test to a population which it's not designed for, typically you will get lower performance on that. And um, the, the tests which are often presented as part of the hard science of neuropsychology are actually grounded in Western cultural practices. For instance, the block design pattern reproduction test. It, it uh, features in many contemporary standardized international tests. African children tend to perform well below Western norms on this task, and it's often been interpreted as evidence of cognitive impairment. So, for instance, um, this, this task uh, is based on the assumption that children are interested in and have experience with trying to solve puzzles, with pictorial perception, with manipulation of blocks, these are all skills which are promoted in Western societies with industrially produced books and toys and are taken for granted by many Western families, teachers, and psychologists. The main cognitive functions which the neuropsychologists are trying to get from this test are very similar to those required for the construction of toys. So for instance, these children here are making their own wire cars uh, three-dimensional skeletal models of vehicles, which they will never probably in their lifetime get to drive, although they may be passengers in them. And you see that the abstraction of form required and the understanding of the principles of steering and suspension are quite sophisticated. Children get no adult guidance in this. There are no handout packages from the shop to tell you how to build it. They teach one another how to build these toys. And it's a very widespread practice in urban and in rural areas. So why do African children perform poorly on the block design tests? In the literature that I looked at in the 1960s, there were statements that African children have a different attitude towards perception, they lack practical intelligence, they have a non-visual sensor type, they have a field-dependent cognitive style, they have difficulty with image transformations, all by distinguished Western researchers uh, but none of these deficit explanations is consistent with the results of a double dissociation experiment which we conducted comparing low-income children from England and from Zambia who were presented with the same shapes to reproduce either in pencil and paper, in clay, or in wire. As predicted from an analysis of their eco-culture environments, the English children scored much higher on the paper and pencil task, the Zambian children much higher on the wire modeling task and the two groups did not differ on clay modeling. 
Going on from there, we designed a test called the Pangamuntu test, which means make a person. And um, this test presupposes only familiarity with the widespread African play activity of clay modeling. There's quite a lot of evidence that it actually relates more to children's home experience than to their school experience, and therefore it may be particularly relevant for assessing street children, orphans who've stopped going to school, refugees. So I was intended to talk a bit about three critical knowledge gaps. I will just cast, uh, skim over the first one, language development in multilingual contexts. Um, we have good evidence, and it was just recently highlighted by the SRCD, that uh, um, multilingual child development is empowering rather than a disadvantage, but we have very little evidence of how children really learn their language in multilingual settings. Um, this is the one that I would like to talk a little more about, the uh, practice of children taking responsibility for um, a younger child has been misrepresented by some international uh, aid agencies as a, an exploitative deprivation of children's rights to play. Uh, the evidence we have from a project which monitored and uh, evaluated this activity applied in an educational setting is it actually is a very effective way of showing respect for a child's um, preparation for adult responsibility. And in the project that we saw, which was initiated by a group of Zambian primary school teachers in a government school in the northern province of Zambia, we saw children plotting growth curves in math classes, discussing health and nutrition in science classes, and going out of the classroom to monitor the growth of a younger child, escorting the child to the clinic, evaluating the child's growth, preparing oral rehydration and even uh, uh, nutritional rehabilitation. The, um, here's a mother who is uh, instructing her child on how to carry the baby on her back. A young boy, it's not only girls who carry young children in this activity, and this is a teacher with his um, student who is escorting a young under five child to the clinic. These are the children studying growth charts. What we saw in this study was that um, the, contrary to the expectation of some um, skeptics, there was a higher academic pass rate on the national secondary school selection exam by the children involved in this project than in children in the, the same school attending traditional conventional class classes. And in follow-up work, 10 years later, what we've seen is that the young people who went through this look back on this as a formative experience which um, led to uh, pro-social values such as uh, cooperation, gender equality, and um, nurture and help for other people. Um, there was a brief reference earlier today to the um, attachment theory. And um, I, what I'd like to uh, point out is that Balbi's evolutionary model has received a great deal of attention and promotion. Um, it uh, is well known, and I won't think bother to summarize it since I've run out of time here, but the um, much less uh, publicity has been given to the fact that there are well-articulated critical alternative positions. And um, Keller and her colleagues in Germany who have done studies in Cameroon and in India showing that the uh, goals of parenting are systematically related to caregiving practices of infants which are quite different in rural African societies from in uh, urban industrialized countries like the United States. So to take the model of attachment and say this is the way to achieve emotional security in adulthood is a very questionable intervention based on a very narrow part of the world's population with a, a theory which is very much under critical uh, reconsideration within Western psychology. So I agree with the first speaker that developmental changes in vulnerability and susceptibility to ameliorative intervention is one of the uh, contributions that developmental science can offer to the design of effective policies. Um, individual and social factors that are protective against poverty and its psychological impact. Exceptions to the developmental trajectory. I think uh, in, in biology this idea of a trajectory has become very um, influential, but in postnatal life, we actually are not kicked off and then, like a, a bullet, 
we can predict where we're going to land, we actually negotiate our journeys through life and a lot of personal agency enters into this and that's one of the things which is at risk I think with this overemphasis on trajectories as a model of development. Um, and finally, I believe that we need to look very closely at uh, research on effective strategies for engaging communities in the promotion of socio-cultural change. In a paper published this year with my good Cameroonian colleague, Bame and Samanang, we identified eight ways forward from this patchy provisional knowledge into responsible intervention. I won't read them all out. I think people here are highly literate and can get these from the slide. Um, but I would like to uh, just emphasize the, the last of these, since this is very much an international meeting, that partnerships in the design and delivery of professional training for ECD providers should be emphasizing the use of indigenous resources, the cultivation of social responsibility, and very much in agreement with Maureen Durkin, the respect for human rights. Thank you for your attention.